Welcome to the Be Smart Podcast with Jared Dillian, how not to be an idiot with your money. Because there's a lot of that going around. What are we going to talk about today? You know, um, so I was sitting in the living room with my wife and she's on the chair, I'm on the couch, she's got her iPad. It's a long story, but let, let me tell you this story. It's a good story. So <laughs> we have six cats and in our house, we give an award to the cat of the month. The best behaved cat of the month wins cat of the month. And we do this for 12 months out of the year. And the best behaved cat for the year wins the cat of the year award. So Vesper won the first award in 2017. Wendy won in 2018. Uma won in 2019. Xenia won in 2020. So we are trying to decide who is going to be the cat of the year for 2021. I really want Tars to win. I mean, Tars is the sweetest boy. He's such a nice cat, but he's bad. He gets in trouble all the time. I mean, he tries to hump his sisters. And just in the last two weeks, he's pooped in the sink twice. He peed on our shoes. He peed on our bed. He's a bad cat. And, you know, what I said to my wife was he's never look under these criteria. He's never going to win cat of the year. He should win cat of the year because he is the nicest, most affectionate, lovable cat. And she disagrees. So my wife wants Wendy to win. And Wendy's like an obvious choice because she is the best behaved cat I've ever had. She never gets in trouble. But she's kind of a blob. She's overweight. She weighs 17 pounds. So one thing we've been talking about doing is getting a plaque to commemorate the cat of the year. And, you know, like one of those employee of the month plaques where it has like the individual plaque things like we want to get one of those for cat of the year and put it up in our house just on a goof, you know. So there's a trophy store in town. And I've been busy. I've been meaning to go to the trophy store and do this. And I just haven't been able to do it. My wife's like, well, let's see what's online. So she goes on Amazon and she finds, I mean, not only does she find a plaque, she finds a plaque with like cats on it. And it's one of these employee of the month plaques. And you can order it on Amazon and you can order the individual things. I don't know what you call them and get them engraved. So she ordered it on Amazon. We are getting a cat of the year plaque. 80 bucks, 80 bucks for the plaque and all the engraving and stuff like that. She's like, that's kind of expensive. And I'm like, no, not really. I think that's pretty fair. I think 80 bucks is totally reasonable. So she orders it. So the way we do things in our house is we keep our money separate. And if we want to buy something together, then one of us pays for it and the other one chips in. So she spent 80 bucks on the plaque. I reached in my wallet. I pulled out a 50, a 10, and four ones, and I gave her 64 bucks. That was my contribution. So she got the cash. Now, that might seem like insane behavior to some people. Like, (laughs) most people, what they do is they have a joint account for common expenses, and they buy stuff out of the joint account. So they would ordinarily pay for the cat plaque out of the joint account. But this is where you run into problems. See, like, you know, my wife and I agree agree on this. But what if we didn't? What if I thought it was a great idea and she didn't? And we were going to pay for it with these common funds and she would veto it. So we wouldn't get the plaque, you know. So here, if I didn't want to get it, I wouldn't have reimbursed her. And she would have bought it with her money, her own money. Or I could have bought it with my own money. But we did it together. So I contributed proportionally. So this is how we do things in our house. We keep our money separate. One person pays for something, the other person pays them back. It may seem like a complicated system, but you know what? We have never, ever fought about money. In our entire marriage, we have never fought about money. Now, some people have joint accounts and they say they've never fought about money. I find that hard to believe. When I say we have never fought about money, not once in 25 years have we fought about money. So my wife likes to buy dresses from a store called Jane McLaughlin. She wears them to work. 
She probably has 75 dresses. Every time I turn around, she's ordering more dresses. If she was spending that money out of a joint account, I could complain about it and see what do you need 75 dresses for? And then we would get into a fight because it's our collective money. But we keep our money separate, so it's her money, and I can't say anything about how she spends her money. It's her money. Conversely, I like to buy clothes from John Varvatos. It's pretty much all I wear are clothes from John Varvatos. Safe to say I have spent a lot of money at John Varvatos. I have 23 John Varvatos jackets. I try to buy them on sale. Sometimes I don't. I would guess on average they cost a thousand bucks. That's twenty three thousand bucks I've spent on jackets alone. And there's nothing she can say about it because it's my money. Now, between the two of us, we make a fair amount of money, so it definitely makes things easier. We're not in danger of running out, but our system is better and we've proven it over time. Now, if you really want to get your mind blown, let me tell you how we do mortgages. And we've done this since 1999. So whenever we take out a mortgage, I build a spreadsheet. I build a mortgage amortization spreadsheet that shows the portion of the payment that goes to principal and the portion that goes to interest. And we each contribute proportionally to the mortgage. So if I make 80% of the money, I put 80% towards the mortgage. She puts 20%. And some of the principal belongs to me and some of it belongs to my wife. And with the last mortgage we had, our current house, it turned out I ended up owning 87% of the house and she owns 13% of the house. When we build our next house, we will sell our old house and we're going to roll that money into the new house and my wife will own a corresponding percentage. So the question I get sometimes from people is, well, what if you get divorced? Well, we don't plan on getting divorced. We've been married for 24 years, but we've actually talked about this before. If we divorce amicably, then I take my money and she takes her money and we go our separate ways. If we don't divorce amicably, if somebody cheats on somebody, then she takes half or I take half and all this goes out the window. It's a good thing we don't plan on getting divorced. Does this sound insane to you? Well, it works for us and it works great. So we keep on doing it, which is my advice to you. If you have a system that works, I don't care what it is. If it works, then keep on doing it. Seriously. But if your system isn't working, and what I mean by that is if you are fighting about money all the time, if it is creating tension and division in your household, then maybe try my way for a while. I have not yet heard the story of the couple that kept their money separate and it wasn't working, so they went back to joint accounts. I haven't heard that story yet. Now, the only time we have ever run into trouble is on taxes. My wife was making the argument for a while that since she had a lower income than me, her taxes should be computed at a lower tax bracket. And I was saying that if we did that, then I would end up paying even more in tax. I would be paying like 45% income taxes because she was paying 15%. And eventually I won that argument, but we had arguments around tax time for years. That was the only place we couldn't figure it out. So my wife has a big chunk of her income withheld for tax relative to what she makes. She's not happy about it, but we both get to enjoy a high standard of living. I mean, Jesus... I bought a Corvette and my wife didn't say anything about it. That is when you know the money situation is good at home. Now, I have heard some stories of couples fighting about money. They're they're screaming at each other over 50 bucks. Holy shit. That is not how I want to spend my life fighting about inconsequential amounts of money. It's actually a big reason couples get divorced is about money which is a really unfortunate reason to get divorced. And, you know, I forget the details of this, but there used to be this psychologist who could predict with 100% accuracy when a couple was going to get divorced. It was when one person spoke about the other person with contempt. I think our marriage is pretty good, though. My wife says she is in charge of all the emotional labor in the house. It's her job to figure out what needs to be done. And then she tells me what to do. But I'm 
I'm like, look, I'm in charge of the actual labor in the house. And I feel a little bit of pressure when I go into work and subscription revenue dries up and I'm losing on my tr- money on my trades, you know? Besides, I scoop the litter boxes and I don't think my wife wants to do that. I'm not a marriage counselor, but I've never run into a situation where keeping your money separate made things worse. It does make things more complicated, but it doesn't make things worse. And if I owe my wife money, I pay her in a second and she pays me in a second. We use Zelle. We use Zelle to send money back and forth to each other. So life is good for me. I want it to be good for you. I'm Jared Dillian. Thanks for listening to Be Smart. See you next time.